L.A. Noir needed one more case. One more crime to solve, one more mystery to unravel. I don't say that because I think the game was too short, or because it didn't have enough content. In fact, it's easy to argue that the game's story was hurt thanks to its lengthy runtime, and that spreading too many little details out across too much time muddled its overarching narrative. So why do I think the game needed another case, and why do I think it would have helped the story? It comes down to emphasis. Taking a moment, late in the game, right after Cole is partnered with Herschel to shine a spotlight on details that some players might have overlooked or misinterpreted earlier in the adventure. But since this video will be talking about L.A. Noir's story, we'll be straying deep into spoiler territory here. I'm gonna spoil everything. So if you haven't played this game, you should go out, give it a shot, and come back some other time. I promise it's a great game, just don't stress too much about save scumming to get everything perfect, you'll drive yourself nuts that way. Either accept that you'll take a few hits here and there and move on, or use a guide if you've just gotta perfect everything. Anyway, there are two big points that I would want to emphasize, or perhaps clarify. Let me explain both of those points in their original context so we can properly discuss this theoretical extra case that I'm proposing. Who is Cole Phelps? L.A. Noir is a detective story, and one of the biggest mysteries is the nature of the main character, Cole Phelps. The game wants to tell you that Phelps is a great detective. They throw that out all the time. He's a great case man! He's the poster boy for the LAPD! This fits well into the framework of a video game. You want to solve cases, you want to catch the bad guy, and you want to advance to the next desk so you can do cool, exciting new things in cool new suits. Because the game is structured around advancing from desk to desk, and progress is an inevitable consequence of the game's design, it's easy to overlook the fact that this is an important part of Cole's character. He's ambitious. Fiercely so. Part of this is just who Cole is, and we can see this behavior in flashbacks to his time training to be an officer. He's naturally ambitious and competitive. But Phelps' ambition is also reflective of his ongoing quest for redemption. Phelps was a Marine in the Pacific Theater of World War II, and as we learn through flashbacks, he was a terrible officer. He made bad decisions because he was a stickler for the rules, for doing things by the book, for following orders. During a particularly costly battle, Cole's entire unit is wiped out, and he winds up hiding in a foxhole, shell-shocked until the battle concludes the following morning. When he's found, his fellow foot soldiers quickly figure out exactly what happened, but the higher-ups don't. Instead, they praise him as a hero for maintaining his position all night and award him the Silver Star for valor in combat. So, several other, um, really, really bad things happen during the war, when other units are collapsing entrances to caves with explosives to prevent ambushes from enemy troops, Phelps, boy scout that he is, is doing things by the book. He orders his unit to clear out the caves with force, including flamethrowers. But when he accidentally marches his troops into a hospital full of Japanese civilians instead of soldiers, he has involved his men not only in the slaughter of innocents, but an actual, literal war crime. So, in addition to blowing the entrance to the cave to cover up their actions, one of Phelps' men shoots Phelps. Not to kill, but just to get him shipped back home and as far away from them as possible. Suffice to say, when Phelps gets back to the States, he doesn't feel so great about his time during the war. But it doesn't matter how he feels, he's a decorated war hero, honorably discharged. So, Phelps' quest through the LAPD is in part a quest of selfishness, but it's also an attempt to redeem himself. He wants to make himself worthy of being called a hero, of being touted as the LAPD's golden boy. Maybe then he can put his past to rest. And until things start to go really bad later in the story, that's kind of working out for him, because all of the traits that made him a bad officer happen to make him a really good cop. The problem is that none of this is even remotely clear to the player until very, very late into the game. We don't find out how he got the Silver Star until the Vice Desk, and we only find out about the incident in the hospital minutes before the end credits roll. If you're paying attention to little details sprinkled in conversations throughout the game, you might start to get a sense of why Cole is the way he is, even without the critical flashbacks, but otherwise you're gonna be left high and dry. This is one of the inherent problems with player characters. Since we, as players, have control over them, we'll often take them at face value. We feel like we have some intimate knowledge of them, and understand who they are, because we are them. This is part of why video games that really care about telling a story will often turn their focus onto an extensive supporting cast, instead of focusing on their protagonist. Now this is not to say that you can't have interesting or nuanced player characters in video games. Far from it. The problem arises when player characters keep secrets from the actual real-life players, when there are important aspects of their personality or motivation that we aren't privy to. When the rug is pulled out from under the player, and some previously unseen aspect of the main character is revealed, you run the risk of the player feeling like this has come from too far out of left field. 
when did this happen? This isn't who this character really is. Plus, in another issue that is unique to video game storytelling, if the player's interests don't line up with the player character's interests, then things can get frustrating really quickly. Hey, Commander Shepard, when do you turn into such a wimp? Why do you care about this kid? I don't care about this kid. Game, stop telling me I should care about this kid! But if you were to give that same frustrating story beat to a member of the supporting cast, instead you'd go, Oh no, Garrus, you care about some dead kid? Oh, that's so sad. Please tell me more so I can max out your social link. So L.A. Noir eventually switches you away from Phelps and into the shoes of Jack Kelso, and I think this was done specifically so it'd be easier to call out some of Phelps' nastier traits. I know you, Cole. You're still beating yourself up over that medal on Sugarloaf. The medal you think you didn't deserve, but you just don't get it. Nobody deserves a medal. It's just the ridiculous situation you find yourself in and how you react to it. You think you failed up on that hill. But courage isn't a tap you can turn on or off. Courage isn't permanent. It's a tenuous and fickle thing. Courage and cowardice exist in every man. Get over it. You got it off your chest. I guess I have. The problem with Jack's little speech there is that it comes in the second to last case in the game. Okay, third to last if you count Nicholson electroplating, but I don't because that was DLC and the majority of people didn't play it. If you go and watch playthroughs of this game, you can see how people's attitudes shift after they start playing as Jack. It's almost shocking how quickly players start to turn on Phelps, how suddenly they figure out what the game is trying to say about him. But again, this magic trick happens very, very late in the game, when it was actually supposed to happen a bit earlier. At the end of the Vice Desk, the game really starts to mess with you and show Phelps in a new light. We see him make some really poor decisions, we watch him get demoted, and then we watch him chase after a crazy conspiracy theory in hopes of restoring his image. Or at least, that last one was supposed to happen but it doesn't really. Uh, let me explain. When Phelps gets bumped down to Arson, his new partner, Herschel Biggs, wants nothing to do with Phelps. Phelps is used to closing cases, but that doesn't happen much in Arson. So when he quickly latches onto a theory that two house fires are connected, Herschel is dismissive. He tells Phelps that they get an average of two house fires a night. He tells Phelps that if Arson is a crime, it almost always can't be solved, and that if it can be solved, it's almost always insurance. Herschel knows this beat, he's been here for years. Surely Phelps is just making mountains out of molehills because he wants an excuse to be a big hero again, right? Well, that's what the game wants you to think, but it doesn't work out that way for a number of reasons, which brings us around to point number two, Phelps' partners. So, on each desk that Phelps gets assigned to, he gets to hang out with a new partner. On patrol, you get to hang out with Ralph Dunn, but no one cares about him, and then on traffic, you get partnered with Stefan Bukowski, who is a good character, but not important to what we're talking about today. The first really interesting partner that you get is Rusty Galloway. Rusty is a lot older than Phelps, and has been working homicide for a long time. He's been there long enough that not much can surprise him anymore, but there's another consequence of that. His job has become just like any other job. Comes into the office, deals with the same old grind, slips in a few drinks where he can manage. Sure, sometimes there's a bigger mystery surrounding a poor dead housewife, but having worked homicide for so long, Rusty has seen this exact same crime scene and this exact same case one too many times. Dead long-suffering housewife? The husband probably did it. <sighs> the husband always does it. Phelps, ambitious and enthusiastic as he is, is unwilling to take easy answers. As more and more dead women appear under similar conditions, Phelps becomes convinced that a serial killer is on the loose and they're arresting the wrong men. Rusty isn't as concerned. The evidence for the men they keep arresting is solid, and the details of these cases have been so highly publicized that it's easy to assume that these are simply copycat killings. Strangled, battered, Yeah, naked. yeah, yeah, we know the M.O. So does every jerk who kills his wife and girlfriend looking for a way out. Rusty is a really interesting character for a couple of reasons, partly for what he can tell us about Phelps by contrasting the two of them, and partly for what he tells us about police work and the kind of moral headspace that the people who do this sort of job can get stuck in. Yes, Rusty is a jerk, but he's not written that way just for the sake of it. He's a very noir character, not necessarily a bad man or a bad cop, but he has become too jaded, too detached from his work. Most murderers aren't geniuses, and most cases aren't complex, so why should he bother to exert himself any more than necessary? He doesn't really think that he needs to work hard to be good at this job, and under most normal circumstances, that mindset works out just fine for him. 
Now, I'm not saying that I want to be best friends with Rusty or even hang out with him more than necessary because he is a big jerk, but I'm afraid that in this modern age of President Trump, people are a bit too quick to write off Rusty as just a jerk and not read into him any more than that. He's not by any stretch of the imagination a positive role model, but he's also not just an asshole. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on with Rusty, but a lot of people seem to reduce him to just two main attributes. His inability to recognize an obvious pattern makes him a bad cop, and his cavalier attitude towards the murdered women makes him a sexist. Okay, I mean, well, yeah, he is a sexist, but it's the 1940s. It kind of comes with the territory. At least he's not an asshole about it. Right, Roy? <laughs> so yeah, a lot of people wind up reading Rusty as a lazy, nearsighted dinosaur, which I think is an unfortunately limited way of looking at his character. Then, after Rusty, Phelps moves on to a partner that I don't think anyone had trouble understanding, Roy Earl. Roy Earl is the worst. Unlike with Rusty, you wouldn't be making a mistake to just read Roy as a horrible person because he really is a truly despicable, horrible person. Any sexism or racism or laziness on his part isn't reflective of some deeper meaning or message that the story is trying to convey. It's just reflective of how Roy Earl is the worst and how institutionalized inequality is the worst. Roy is the smarmiest, scummiest, most narcissistic, corrupt, backstabbing, sleazy piece of human filth that you'll encounter in the game. While not the main villain, he is certainly intended to be the main subject of both Phelps and the player's hatred. Now, this isn't to say that Roy is just a simple cartoonish caricature, but it's just hard to misunderstand who he is or what his role is in the story. The problem that we encounter, though, is the trend that's now been established. You've just spent a lengthy chunk of the game with a lazy jerk, and then you go through several cases with an actual villain. And I think that all of that, along with the murky nature of Cole's character and backstory, sets players up with the wrong expectations for the game's final partner, Herschel Biggs. By the time you get through a case or two with Herschel, I think that most players will have him figured out, but during the beginning hours of Arson, things are a bit murkier. The player lands on Arson after Cole screws up, commits adultery, and is demoted. He goes from golden boy to subject of universal ridicule. And it's not your fault! Phelps was the one who screwed up, and then Roy snitched on him! The player doesn't deserve this! Now, if we were looking at this like a book or a movie, it'd be easier to see Cole as a character detached from ourselves. But since he's our character, and because this is a video game, some aspects of this are thrown out of whack. Surely the game has put us here for a reason. After all, this is a level, a new case, so it's time to get out there and solve it. Since we're here solving this case, there must be a win state, a solution. Since this is a story, as soon as we see the connection between the two house fires, it's so obvious that it can't just be a coincidence. I mean, in real life, you know, maybe it could have just been a coincidence. But here, in this video game? No way, gotta be a conspiracy. That's why the story demoted Phelps, so he can chase after this new conspiracy. But over here in the passenger seat, your new partner Herschel is insisting that Phelps is only making a big deal out of this so he can solve a big case and salvage his reputation. At this point in the story, we're supposed to be skeptical of Phelps, and we're supposed to be asking if Herschel is right about him. Maybe Phelps is making something up out of desperation. But a lot of players don't do that. Instead, they hear this old cop whining about how there is no conspiracy and how Phelps is crazy, and the player's first reaction is, oh great, I get to spend this desk with Rusty 2.0. By the time that you get to the end of the story, I think that all of this becomes a lot clearer, and certainly on a second playthrough, it's much easier to pick out what's going on thematically at any given moment. But again, so much important information about Cole is pushed so late in the game that a clear picture only emerges in the hours and minutes before the game's abrupt conclusion. I'm not going to talk a lot about the very, very ending of this game, other than to say that I think it's great. It fits with all the characters, and it allows Phelps the opportunity to become the hero that he strived to be all along. He abandons the final lead that he needs to tear down the conspiracy, breaking the self-destructive pattern of perfectionism that he's been locked into for the entire game's runtime. And only by doing this is he able to help Jack and Elsa escape to safety in time. But because a lot of people miss that build-up, and because things only align moments before the conclusion, I think a lot of people found the ending to be too abrupt and too unsatisfying. So we're gonna try and patch that up a little bit. Without really derailing the existing story or changing things about how the game originally played out, let's talk about a theoretical extra case that would go right at the beginning of the arson desk, and its primary objective would be to cast Cole Phelps in a negative light. We need to show that arson cases are usually dead ends, and that Phelps is desperately looking for a big case. The idea that Phelps gets pushed to arson and immediately stumbles upon a conspiracy is absurd. What are the chances? We need to show that Herschel actually knows what he's talking about, and that being stuck on arson is a slog. The slog that Herschel has been stuck in for years and knows all too well. So let's title our theoretical case something like The Nightly Show. 
See you at the next show. Show? The next fight. This would really emphasize the repetitious, predictable nature of the job. The nightly show would start very similarly to The Gas Man. It's Phelps' first day on arson, and he's been assigned to Herschel. You can have the beginning of this case play out almost identically to The Gas Man if you want, except that the first house would involve either fatalities, or the family would simply have been out late into the night instead of fully out of town on vacation. At that first house, the fire would actually just be an accident, a tragic coincidence. There would be basically no evidence, and the entire scene would be a dead end. We then go on to the next burned house, where the owners claim to have barely escaped from the fire in the middle of the night. While searching the scene, we'd actually find evidence of some kind of criminal activity. Phelps sees a larger conspiracy, an attempted murder covered up with a house fire. Herschel sees it differently, an insurance scam on the part of the homeowners, who don't seem appropriately torn up over the destruction of all of their belongings. From here, there are a number of ways that the actual investigation can proceed, but the main point of it is that Phelps is barking up the wrong tree, and Herschel is dead on from the start. If you really want to rub it in and make a big narrative point, you could have the case go unsolved, which would be a first for Phelps. Herschel, and eventually Phelps by the end of the case, become confident that the house fire was insurance fraud, but they can't prove it. Circumstantial evidence collected along the way, and strange behavior on the part of the homeowners leaves them both with the hunch that the fire was intentional, but they can't prove anything. Phelps would become frustrated. How could they get away with it? Herschel just tells him that he'll get used to it. That's the way arson is. That may not be so satisfying from a gameplay perspective, though, and you actually don't get to solve that many arsons on the arson desk, so it might be fun to let the player go ahead and solve this little case of insurance fraud. Phelps would still have to reluctantly give up on his conspiracy theory, and Herschel would still be shown to be an experienced detective. After you finish playing through our theoretical The Nightly Show case, we would then move on to The Gas Man, which would play out mostly like it does in the original. The dialogue in the opening would change to reflect the fact that Phelps has been on the job for a couple of weeks, and he's starting to get used to the routine of dead-end, no-mileage cases, day in and day out. Then, when he gets a real, tangible whiff of conspiracy with the vacation sweepstakes, he'd immediately latch onto it, much to Herschel's frustration. Again with this nonsense, Cole? He'd ask. Only this time, of course, it'd turn out that there actually is something bigger going on. But why do I feel like the game needed this theoretical case? After all, while I did talk about how some of the details of the game's story don't become clear until right at the very end, they do become clear to most people by the end. By the time that the credits roll, the game's overall point about Cole usually becomes apparent to most players. So why do I feel like it would be useful to go and add a bit of clarification a mere six or seven hours before the game's conclusion? Well, there's a couple of reasons. For one, I think that enough players are so thrown for a loop by the whole Elsa situation and the sudden poor treatment of Phelps that they miss some really good storytelling that goes on at the beginning of the arson desk. A lot of people read all that anger that's directed at Cole as unfair treatment, all happening because Roy screwed him over. Now it's time for a comeback, baby, the player says, when they're really supposed to be saying, hey, yeah, maybe Phelps is a bit more of a jerk than I thought. And not just because he cheated on his wife and screwed up back in the war, but for a lot of other reasons. Maybe he's not such a good person after all. Maybe there is some stock to all the stuff Herschel is saying about him. Plus, I... Hey, you know what? I just, I just really like Herschel Biggs, man. He's one of my favorite characters in this whole game, and I think that a lot of the stuff he says in the first two cases of arson gets misinterpreted because of all the stuff we talked about earlier with Phelps' partners. Instead of a good cop on a dead-end beat, he seems like another stick in the mud who doesn't want to cooperate with the genius detective superstar Cole Phelps. By the time that players get to the end of Arson's second case, A Walk in Elysian Fields, I think that sentiment is mostly gone. But I know from watching playthroughs and from talking to some other people who have beaten the game that players can really get the wrong idea about Herschel initially. Which is a shame, because some of the scenes with Herschel in The Gas Man and A Walk in Elysian Fields are among my favorite scenes in the whole game. So something finally got to you. You want my help, pretty boy? You got it. You keep riding me, and you won't be pretty much longer. We can get this guy, Herschel. You think you've seen everything, Phelps? I was with the second Marines at Bella Wood. The things that went on in that farmhouse. My own guys, on fire, screaming for a way out. You're not gonna get this guy. There's gonna be no photos and no citations. We're gonna kill this miserable fuck. End of story. You get this. But when players assume that Herschel is an uncooperative asshole who is refusing to listen to Phelps' conspiracy theories because he's just too lazy, a scene like that can feel more like a heel turn than a logical progression. 
Herschel is, in my own humble opinion, the best and most interesting partner in the game, but the trend established by his predecessors and the general attitude the game has towards Phelps at the beginning of Arson can really sour a player's first impression of him. And also, as I said before, many of these problems stem from the fact that L.A. Noir is a video game and not, say, a novel or a TV series. I think that if you removed the mindset surrounding Cole that comes from him being the player character, his nature would become a lot clearer a lot more quickly. Or, I don't know, maybe it's less to do with the nature of video game design and more to do with the general audience of video games. L.A. Noir oversteps. I mean, it oversteps in a lot of areas, but I specifically mean that its story comes close to transcending the typical trappings of its medium. It's just as well written as any Oscar-nominated film or classic piece of noir cinema. But people tend to have pretty low expectations when it comes to narrative in video games. Maybe people didn't pick up on some of the details along the way because they underestimated this game and figured it was just going to be a pulpy shoot-bang adventure about car chases and rousting punks. Rouse punks. Thank you, Jack Lord. The game's marketing campaign certainly helped to set up those expectations, but I can't really be too mad at it. Rockstar's marketing campaign for this game was nothing short of genius. It wouldn't have reached the audience that it did otherwise. Maybe I'll have to talk about it some other time. As much as I do think that L.A. Noir's story suffers from being a little bit too long and spreading too much information out across its lengthy runtime, the extra case that I'm suggesting here is really just a minor addition, a band-aid applied to a relatively negligible wound. The tale of Cole Phelps and pals is good enough that it doesn't really need any help from the likes of me, so I think I'll be putting this case back on the shelf, at least for now. L.A. Noir probably isn't the best video game story ever told or anything like that, but damn if it doesn't give it a good try. No, Phelps. You're not the worst asshole going around. Thanks, Herschel. Thanks for watching me talk about one of my personal favorite games. If you stuck around and watched this entire thing, even though you haven't played it before, uh, I mean, it's too late now, you've already done it, but you should still go out and play it, because it's a really, really good game. And if you played it back when it launched and haven't returned to it since then, you may want to look back into it again, because you probably missed some really neat stuff at the time. Anyway, I wanted to crank this video out pretty fast as a personal challenge to myself, and I think that it went pretty well. I need to get a lot more practice with making videos like this, so I'm going to try and crank out a couple other videos in this style pretty quickly just to get some experience under my belt. If you like this, you can check out some other videos that I've made that were a little bit more precisely put together than this one. I personally recommend the two videos that you see on screen right now, but of course you're more than welcome to peruse the rest of my videos. Sometimes you gotta shake the tree and see what falls out. <laughs>